This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 611, recorded on May 8th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. How's everything? Everything is fine. I mean, quiet, obviously. I look out the window. It's cloudy. It's cold. It's supposed to snow tomorrow or later tonight. Snow. Wow. Snow. Yeah. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 84 degrees, uh, <laughs> mostly mostly cloudy, a lot of wind. Uh, it's okay. It's good. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's a 56 Fahrenheit 13C overcast, and uh, we've got some rain and maybe some snow coming. Right. From uh, Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's good to be here. It's 48 and rainy here, and I think it's going to eventually end up snow tonight as well. <laughs> and our guest today is here to put some teeth into this episode yeah. <laughs> from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. It's a balmy 72 degrees. We never do centigrade on TWIM, so I have no <laughs> idea what that is. <laughs> it's too bad Kathy isn't here. She'll give you a rundown. All right. We will start with a clinical report from Daniel Griffin. All right. Um, well, let me, I'm going to try to keep this uh, to the point because I know we have a lot of busy clinicians uh, listening to this first part of the episode. Um, but I'm hoping at this point they're all, uh, they're all hooked and they're staying for the whole thing. Maybe they make this part of their Friday night or their Sunday morning ritual. Um, but I wanted to start off with the first thing too. You know, we hear a lot in numbers, and um, I wanted to try to to give those numbers a certain reality because we're we're well, we're getting ready to open back up all across the country. Um, s- People are talking about what to do about summer camp, how to get back to work. Um, and then people are even talking about uh, universities opening up for uh, people being on campus in the fall. So, um, you know, I, I've been working a lot of my day in the intensive care unit. And uh, the receptionist, uh, ward clerk there in the intensive care unit, her her brother a couple weeks ago got sick. Um, and he he's a professor himself, actually. He's a teacher himself. He was uh, uh, did mostly special education. Um, he, he was really involved in his community. And a few weeks back, he, he wasn't feeling so well. So he, he called up um, the, uh, the ward clerk, um, his sister, and said, you know, I'm not feeling so great. I'm going to head over to the hospital um, just to get checked out. Well, ended up getting admitted. Um, had COVID, was um, getting progressively worse, um, actually to the point where this um, this gentleman in his 60s uh, started to uh, develop trouble um, breathing. He was actually put on these BiPAP machines, I think we've talked about, this where you know a certain amount of pressure when you breathe in, a certain amount of pressure when you breathe out. Um, our ICU doc was on the phone talking with their doctors. They were pretty much um, overwhelmed as far as capacity. So they had elected to put him into a, a negative pressure room with the door closed instead of in an intensive care unit. Um, and then when they went to check on him a few hours, the BiPAP had come off and, and this gentleman was was dead in the room. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I think that w- we see numbers, oh. you know, but but each one of those numbers that uh, you it's see. It's a person. Um, each yeah, it, it's, a, it's a person, right? I That's mean, right. Um, right. we saw, you know, in New York City, I think yesterday there were over 400 um, new deaths. Um, you know, so and I think um, in the country yesterday, we, we hit another nice high, so to speak, uh, 2,528 on the world meter total. Um, and each one of those 2,528 um, numbers, that, that's a person, that's someone's brother, that's someone's dad, that's someone's daughter. That's it's hundreds of other people per person, right? I mean, yeah. because of all the extended family and everything, it's a, it's a big loss. Yeah, it's tremendous. So as we as we open back up, um, let's let's all work together to you know because every one of those numbers is a person. So 
um, just trying to put a human face on all the things that we talk about. Um, so, so my theme uh, for everybody this uh, this week will be first, do no harm, and be careful with experimental therapies. Um, and uh, sort of recap a few things, but also I want to introduce something new that we're just, uh, I think we're just starting to really recognize. Um, so we've been talking about several stages of the illness. We've talked about the really difficult control issue to this pre-symptomatic viral shedding phase. Um, looks like at least a day or two before people have any symptoms, they have a um, tremendous amount of viral shed. This is then followed by that viral phase, which we're beginning, beginning to realize just broader and broader. Um, in addition to the just feeling crummy, all the viral um, symptoms that we're used to seeing, um, we're also seeing um, a well-characterized uh, list of skin manifestations, right? And so the classic, um, become classic in about a month here, the COVID toes, which is this pseudo chill bane. You look at someone's toes and it looks like they dipped their toes into some very hot water. Um, there's this vesicular eruption where it looks like they've got chicken pox or actually more smallpox, right? It's all over the place, same state of development. Um, sometimes they just have urticaria. They look like, you know, they're having an allergic reaction. You know, you wonder if they ate strawberries or something, hives all over the body. Um, sometimes they have, we call it maculopapular, sort of our generic um, little small um, patches. Maybe they even have little bumps um, in certain areas. Another, which is um, really actually fascinating to see, is something called levado reticularis. Um, and this almost looks like you've got this serpiginous edge to these different um, rashes that are developing on the arms and the trunk. Um, and then actually, maybe the most devastating is the necrotic skin manifestation. We actually see areas where there's just um, dead black areas of skin. Um, and I, I use this as a sort of a segue into, we see a lot of the dermatological manifestations, or I want to say we see this more commonly in children. Um, we're not sure exactly why, but that brings us into this newly described, newly appreciated late hyperinflammatory phase. And I don't know if um, our listeners have been following um, the media much, but I think that uh, they probably have. Everyone's locked at home um, and everyone's very curious about news about uh, COVID-19. But a couple things started to happen, right? We started noticing that we were seeing things that we didn't normally see at higher frequency than we were used to. And one of the things that um, happened was they noticed at one of the New York hospitals that they they saw a, a cluster, it was about 15 kids who had this, um, this vasculitis, uh, which um, you guys, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, the... Uh, Kawasaki's like manifestation. Um, it's not actual Kawasaki's. It seems to be a bit different. These kids are a bit sicker. It's not, um, not just swollen lymph nodes. It's not just vasculitis. Um, but there's, there's actually seeming this hyper inflammatory. So this is this apparently late hyper inflammatory phase. And when, um, the 15 kids were described in the city, a lot of phone calls, a lot of communication, we realized that, oh, you know, you might see one of these a month, but now you're seeing 15. Another hospital might see one a month. They saw 17. Another hospital might see one a month. They're seeing a dozen. So we're beginning to realize that a lot of these kids, are PCR negative at this point, but they had an exposure. And this actually prompted a publication that just came out of England today um, that was in The Lancet. And where they noticed, you know what? We had, um, I think it was eight children um, who had known exposures um, and basically came in septic. And when they went through, most of them, most of them were PCR negative, except for the first one in the series who actually died and the PCR came back from the postmortem. Um, but these were um, children coming in with exposures to a father, a grandfather um, weeks before. And what we're beginning to be concerned about is this whole idea that we've said is, oh, you don't have to worry about children. You may not have to worry about children in the first week, in the second week, in the third week. But now that we're out a little bit farther, um, it looks like we're having children with this late hyperinflammatory stage. We're also seeing as part of this late hyperinflammatory stage, this abrupt onset of quadriplegia. We talked about the 
Guillain Barre. Um, and at least the impression is this might be immunoglobulin mediated, maybe even more than that. Um, so this is just another thing, you know, just, just the virus just keeps giving. It's uh, very frustrating <laughs> as a clinician. Kids, uh, do these, most of these kids survive? So, um, you know, again, it takes time to die, right? And so, um, you know, so far, um, most of the kids that we're hearing about are still alive. Um, but this series that came out of England, um, it was actually six days <clears throat> from the time this child was admitted to the time that he died. Um, and when I say children, the child who died in the um, in the UK experience was 14. We normally think of Kawasaki's as being something under the age of 10, um, but we're seeing a range of five, six, nine, ten teenagers. I mean, I'm just thinking how this is different from the common cold coronas, but maybe Kawasaki is is caused by some of them, and we just don't look. Interesting. You know, I have to actually say that was always one of the theories of. Um, Kawasaki's actually some of these sort of um, inflammatory mediated vasculitides is that there was some sort of a trigger. And actually, you know, Vincent, that was one of my first thoughts was, oh, maybe we've found the trigger. Maybe yeah. if we start looking at those common coronaviruses, which now everyone has memorized the numbers, right? <laughs> you know, 229E, <laughs> old cow 43. Right. Um, you know, maybe it's actually one of those that, you know, four weeks before, it, you know, I don't think we really had the radar for that. People always talked about it, but which virus do you look for? Um, and I don't know if our serologies were as good as, you know, they're becoming now as we spend all this time, but um, that is an interesting issue. Right. So I, I must uh, give you a side note here. I do watch too much television, Vincent. <laughs> right. So I actually happened to see Peter Hotez about three days ago talking about Karasaki's uh, around 930 in the morning on CNN. So uh, Parasites Without Borders was right there. Oh, that's fantastic. No, keep, <laughs> keep yeah. Um, so the other things I want to talk about, and I think this is important, is now we're seeing um, – and this is good, I'm going to say. What we're seeing now is we're seeing more control trials, um, which is good because early on, I think it was the throw the kitchen sink. And I was um, doing a virtual lecture and discussion at University of Minnesota um, earlier today. And um, basically, the, the person, one of the other speakers made the point of the majority of things we try – hurt people, right? So that, that's the that's part of the principle of first do no harm because, oh, just try something. You know, the human body is very complicated and most of our attempts to help actually cause harm. And um, so I think people are starting to remember that, remember their training, so to speak, and step back. So no longer are people getting three liters of vitamin C and drowning in the ICU. Um, we're seeing less of, you know, antibiotics being used to treat viral diseases. Um, but now that we have trials, um, we have so many trials that we have a lot of, um, I'll say, investigators, um, principal investigators that are sort of new to the whole trial experience. Um, and so this is sort of a word of caution um, to uh, clinicians um, who are enrolling their patients in different trials or having their patients enroll in different trials that you, you're still their doctor. So you want to still guide them. Um, so one of the things um, we talk about, so remdesivir is now um, being used and uh, we're actually starting to put patients on that um, through the new remdesivir access program. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea there is still the same idea we've always had. Um, David Ho was actually just speaking about uh, this in a, um, in a Columbia talk, actually right before this, about an hour ago. And, uh, you know, we think the antivirals work earlier. So you want to look at getting this, um, getting access to your uh, patients who are early in disease, still in the viral phase. That's probably the uh, the time when you're going to make the most difference. The non-ICU patients we anticipate will get more benefit. And also it's five days versus 10. So you could treat twice as many of those individuals, just thinking about um, limited resources. Um, the other is that we say this is for the most sick, the most severe. You don't have to wait till they're till they're on their deathbed. You actually want to use this to keep them from ending up on their deathbed. So I think that's important. Um, the other is we've started to use plasma. Um, and I think a word of caution here, again, timing is critical in just about everything we know. I think we know this in medicine. But remember, plasma is actually plasma. It's not serum. So this is packed full of clotting factors. So 
if you give this in the first week or so, when there's a lot of virus, that might make sense. But um, if you give it during the coagulation phase, basically, you could sort of think of what might happen if you give your sick patient who's having um, thromboembolic complications um, a concentrated infusion of, infusion of clotting factors. Um, and actually, we saw some experience with SARS-1 that giving it late was maybe not so good, not even sure it was without harm. So um, as we're seeing that, um, also, we're hopefully now that we have um, more I will say higher hanging fruit um, medicines and uh, therapeutics designed specifically for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID-19. Um, we're ramping up. I was on a call earlier today with Regeneron talking about trying to give first week, so early outpatients, um, the cocktail of their um, special um, any antibodies, basically. He was, he was uh, Giorgio Ancopoulos was on CNN News this morning. Okay, this fantastic. Is a, this is a phase one. Yeah. Um, so actually, the phase ones are already already underway. Actually, um, wow. so this is going to be moving forward. These are going to be efficacy trials. Uh, so uh, Daniel, yeah. if you head the virus off at the pass, so to speak, early on and prevent all the damage and then the cytokine storms later on, do you predict that the cytokine storms will be reduced as a result of? Uh, Le less viral load experience in the beginning? I, I would predict that. I mean, the experience that we've had so far, and uh, David Ho had just talked about um, looking at this in uh, a number of Columbia patients, is that the patients with the most robust immune response with the highest antibody um, production, those are the ones that do the worst. So if you can get rid of the virus early on during that first yeah, week, yeah, during the first yeah. 10 days, um, you can prevent all that antigenic stimulation of the immune system sure. and uh, keep people from ending up in the hospital. And now, as we're realizing, maybe even keep people from ending up with some of these late stage complications. This is an IV drug? Um, it is. It would be an IV. And actually, we've talked about um, having nurses go out or have uh, patients just come into an urgent care um, and basically get a small butterfly needle put into a vein, almost like you're getting a blood draw. But this time you're actually getting um, one of these small infusions of these these antibody cocktails are humanized antibody cocktails. Um, so we anticipate with the track record of this therapy being very um, low risk. Uh, but I think that's the big thing. We're We're now moving to not what's on the shelf, um, but what are we actually designing? So I feel like we're we're moving. F we we keep moving forward. We're learning more and more about the disease, and now we're actually starting to get to the point where we're having um, specific engineered therapies for this virus, not just something that happens to be around from something previously. Do you think there's another drug like remdesivir that uh, could be taken orally as a yes? There is. <laughs> there is. That was yeah. A, a, yeah. NHC. Yeah. It's called NHC. So do you think that's going to hit the shelves soon? No, no, it's not going to hit the shelves. It's got to go through phase one. It might be in it, but it's not. Understood, but it would be a miracle if that should work out. Hmm. Look, the problem here is if you wait for people to get sick, it's too late. No, I'm, I'm saying you take it. That's what we learned from the remdesivir. No, no. And so even if you give them IV uh, monoclonals, if they're already in a serious disease state, the virus, as Daniel has said, the virus is already declining at that point. Sure. So you have to get them really earlier, which means before they get sick, and that's very hard. So I'm thinking that, you know, like <laughs> malaria, for instance, you can take a drug that actually prevents the disease, right? So why why not just take a drug that prevents this virus it's to begin with? Antiviral yeah. will block, but who are you going to treat? No, you're not going to treat people. anybody. You can take it as a preventative. What like are you going like to do? Give it to everyone? Lozenge. You're going to give IV? Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying that it, it has to morph into an oral drug yeah, in yeah, order for sure. this to work. Yes, I agree. You could give it to a lot of people in an outbreak situation, sure, but not IV monoclonals. No, All right, no, let no, me no, keep no. let me keep going with the first part. Then, we'll, <laughs> right, then right. we'll we'll beat up on Dixon. Um, sure, no, that's so, okay. He's tough. He's tough. <laughs> that's Trust okay. me. <laughs> so the next thing um, that um, I, I'll talk on is um, just sort of recommendations. There's been a lot of push as we're reopening to try to ramp up testing. So we've gone from a model initially where we did a lot of testing to basically turn on the lights, and make it clear that there was. Um, active community spread in New York. And now looking at some of the serology stuff, it actually looks like this virus was already in New York in late January. 
And actually, there was a study looking at um, serial prevalence and people coming to the ER at Columbia, right by you guys, actually, right where you guys usually are, right where we usually are. Um, and actually, in, in one week, 4% of the people that had blood testing were already um, seropositive in the third week of February. So this has been, this has been here for a little while. Yep. Now we're at a stage... Um, where we need to start doing um, a bit of testing because people need to know who is sick when everyone's returning back to work. So, um, you know, we're actually starting to encourage people to expand their testing um, because, you know, there's a balance here. Some people don't like the numbers. The numbers are scary. But what's scarier is not knowing who has it and then basically forcing us to shut back down again. So uh, we can do our part. When the patient calls, I've only been sick for a day or two. We're trying to expand the number of tests that we're encouraging people to do. You don't want to send someone into the workplace shedding virus. Next thing you know, uh, the entire group, everyone is sick and out of work. So we need to start, you know, ramping our testing back up. That's key. Um, telehealth, we've really ramped that up. And I think that's fantastic. Um, and the other thing, as we see testing expand in other parts of the country, uh, I think people are quite surprised at how much um, infection is already there. Um, and then the other part, and I think this just sort of goes to the various stages, even patients not sick enough to end up in the hospital um, are going to have a lot of questions. The first week, it might be a question of which of my medicines am I taking right now? Should I keep taking? Um, we've learned um, that the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, those classes of antihypertension medicines, um, don't stop taking them. Uh, there's no evidence that they're harmful. They may even have some benefit. So keep taking those. Um, if you're taking a daily aspirin a day, I know there was a lot of questions about, oh, don't take non-steroidals. Keep taking that aspirin a day. Um, what about your allergy medicines? You know, one thing I'll say, sneezing is not a symptom of COVID-19. <laughs> right. That might be that might be the only thing COVID-19 doesn't <laughs> cause you to do. I think exactly. everything else it does. Um, so, you know, our, our advice at this point, um, antihistamines for your allergies, these are probably good things so that you don't end up um, confused, confusing your allergy symptoms with um, with. COVID-19. Um, but in general, you know, as physicians, as patients, we, we want to communicate because there's a lot of questions. Don't just do something because you read about it on, um, you know, the deep state, <laughs> as I guess we've been referred to. But um, no, like to communicate doctor um, patient communication on all these questions that might come up. So you're actually getting the, the best guidance and the best advice. And then the last thing I'll just close with is, um, serologies, right? There's a lot of serologies out there, more questions than answers. Um, the tough thing I just got the call about this morning was um, the, the wife was quite upset because the husband went and got a serology test. And then the call from the primary care was, um, my husband was told he was immune. <laughs> His antibody came back positive and he's now immune. So he has stopped washing his hands. He won't wear a face mask. Um, you know, <laughs> I really worry about But this. he never um, did wash his hands. So don't worry about that. <laughs> I guess he washed his hands for a couple months here, you know. I'm hoping everyone continues to wash their hands. But, you know, we have to be careful with this information. The, the tests that we have out there, um, we'll talk about who's doing them. So some people are being sent to Quest Diagnostics. This is not an FDA reviewed test. There's there's no ability to know for certain the sensitivity, specificity, what a positive test really means, what a negative test really means. The word probably should be included in every sentence. Um, if it's negative, you could say you probably were not infected. If um, you are positive, that might go along with your pro you probably were infected. I I make a point, I think I mentioned this last time, is I call every positive test um, in someone that I've um, done a test on and have a long conversation. Um, did you have a compatible illness? Were you PCR positive? How far are we from that point in time? Because um, we've certainly had people with positive IgG tests who then have a positive PCR. Um, we've certainly, and this is a problem with, I think, some of the um, local health system um, research assays, had patients with documented PCR positive illness, and now they've got a negative um, serology test. And so um, the sensitivity, the specificity on these assays is all over the map. Um, so it's interesting to have this. Mm -hmm. We're learning about it. 
but you know, use the word probably in every sentence that you um, use. And please don't tell someone that the serology test confirms that they are immune and now they may wander the world with unwashed hands. <laughs> oh boy, that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it's it's uh, coming from leaders saying you're immune if you're antibody positive, right? That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the leaders also don't wear masks when they speak to us on the television either. So it's really depressing to see them not following the rules that they agree to. Mm -hmm. So it's a very sad state of affairs. Yeah, you know, I have to say on that point is I know Pence after his visit to, I think it was the Mayo Clinic. Um, was it Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic? I forget which. But he actually afterwards said, you know, I think that was a mistake not wearing a mask. And I appreciate when someone is is able to say, hey, I made oh, a mistake. Have you heard the latest, by the way, that one of the valets of uh, Trump uh, tested positive today? What's a valet? Yeah, what a is valet it? is the person who goes out for Big Macs when he's hungry. And brings them back and then <laughs> gives them to him at his desk and waits okay. on him hand and foot. Okay, I don't have one of those. <laughs> no, no, but the president, uh, all of them had at least three or four because they have to take care of the daily, you know, it's time for your exercise now, or you got to go down to lunch, or you got to finish your breakfast, or you got to get some sleep, all those things. These people are there to advise him to do those things. So one of them turned up positive today. Okay. Serologically Good. positive, or Fine. rather, a PCR positive. Excuse me, Daniel. Daniel, are you still negative? I'm still negative, and you know, um, so, yeah. No. This, and actually, my partner uh, Nujali just got her test. She's the one who's been working with me um, at Plainview, um, and she's still negative. So, so uh, medicine this is works. this is you know. So I think uh, proper PPE, proper attention to detail. You don't have to throw up your hands. Um, we're not all going to get this. There's there's a way to actually uh, be careful. Exactly. And, uh, Daniel, we had one question from Alina who wants to know if people who are pregnant or ha or take hormonal birth control are at higher risk for developing a blood clot since they both get higher estrogen. You know, we have seen a fair amount of uh, clotting issues in um, pregnant women and people on um, hormonal therapy. Actually, that was one of the earliest cases. I think I reviewed a case report on this early on. And it was a woman who um, came in for a C-section in one of the New York hospitals and then um, had a pulmonary embolism right afterwards. And so it's, it's interesting because in general, we would say that, you know, we haven't seen the signal in pregnant women that we saw in MERS and SARS and H1N1. Um, hmm. But the clotting issue, which people didn't always get the connection there, um, that that is clearly a problem. Oh, so good. excellent question. Okay, thank you. Good. All right, Daniel, thank you again. All right, yes. thank you very much. Thank you. Michael, I asked you to come on because uh, you seem to know something about dentistry and how to deal with SARS-CoV-2. First, tell us, uh, why do you know about dental school? Well, I'm on the faculty uh, at the Medical University's Dental School here in Charleston. I've been on its faculty since I arrived once upon a time in the last century, and I am also on the faculty of the medical school. So I do okay. double duty. And for the since 2002, I have been the course director that teaches uh, dental microbiology and infectious diseases to the students. And infection control is one of the topics I happen to lecture to them on. And I'm on the uh, infection control committee for the for that particular college. And so I get to hear all the things that they worry about. And as our regular listeners of, of TWIV will know, aerosols and droplet transmission is how we think SARS-CoV-2 has managed to spread so readily across our globe. And listeners of last week's uh, TWIV and TWIM will also recall that we now know that there are high levels of SARS-CoV-2 messenger RNA within saliva. And anyone who has ever had their teeth cleaned or any dental work done knows that the dental profession likes to use drills, uh, which is referred to in the vernacular as a high-speed high speed hand, hand piece, 
or they also use something called an ultrasonic scaler, which goes by one of the trade names of a Cavitron. That's one of my favorite instruments, by the way. (laughs) The Cavitron? (laughs) Yes. It drives me up a wall. It absolutely drives me up a wall. Well, you know, anytime you can impart a tremendous amount of kinetic energy to a liquid, the particle size effectively becomes much smaller. And in the vernacular, you are generating aerosols. And many of our listeners have seen the New York Times piece about aerosols and how far they can go. And, you know, while the CDC is advocating six feet as appropriate social distancing, if you happen to be in an environment where there are um, a large volume of aerosols being generated on a routine basis. And, you know, in the paper that I picked for us all, there were um, 898 dental students in this one Chinese dental school. And as you can well imagine, all of those students working on patients will generate a tremendous volume of aerosols. And many of our dental schools have large, open cavernous operatories where the walls only go up partially. They don't go all the way to the ceiling. So the aerosol is just free to spread. And as the Times article pointed out, these aerosols can often go distances greater than six meters. And the amount of kinetic energy that is imparted by the high-speed handpiece or the drill or a three-way syringe, or an ultrasonic scaler can really generate everything from a coarse particle, which is operationally defined as two and a half to 10 microns in size, to fine particles, to even the ultra-small particle, which the ultra-fine particles are those less than 0.1 microns. And so they are the true filterable agent that can get through our 0.2 micron filters. And, um, you know, it's that virus that is below that 0.1 size that can then enter the bloodstream. And as some folks, and I think you guys covered this on, on TWIV, though I'm a few episodes behind, there are a large number of our tissue types throughout the human body that have the ACE2 receptor, you know, everything from brain to heart to kidney to liver. And so consequently, should you inhale and then it that small aerosolized particle crosses into the bloodstream, it can just literally wander the highway of the human body and find an organ that has an ACE2 receptor and voila, you have infected a new site beyond the traditional portal of entry, which is, of course, the nasal pharyngeal cavity. And well, if that cell is permissive beyond just having the receptor. Yes, but we now know that those cells, you know, the heart is a permissive organ. We have seen infections in the heart. We have seen in fe- kidney and in the liver as well. So right. it is indeed uh, permissive. So OSHA the truly governing body of almost everything that has to do with workplace has classified dentistry as a very high risk category for the acquisition and transmission of SARS, principally as the result of the use of the tools of the trade. Um, And, you know, the, the danger is, is that these aerosols that we have just everyone who has ever been to a dentist knows that even though the dentist goes to great pains to minimize the, uh, you know, the distribution of those aerosols, they still get out. And the size, the size of dental particles uh, routinely generated is less than 50 microns. And the smaller particles that routinely come out of with these various hand pieces are in the 0.5 to 10 micron size. And so that's enough to worry about um, the particles 
spreading through the operatory. And if you happen to uh, been to your dentist of late, you know, many of them have multiple chairs in which the dentist hops from place to place after the hygienist has cleaned your teeth. And they often have many hygienists who are cleaning teeth and Every one of those is generating an aerosol. And in New York State, um, New York State actually stipulates that in a dental practice, you ha- and the typical dental operatory is about 80 square feet or seven and a half square meters, that you have a minimum of two outdoor air exchanges per hour with a minimum total air exchanges of six per hour. And, you know, if you want to relate this to environments that you go to more frequently, like Vincent's basement, Vincent's basement (laughs) is recommended to have three to four air changes per hour. Otherwise, Vincent may get a little wacky and uh, your house is supposed to have about five to six as well. And churches and coincidentally laboratories should have between eight to 12 air changes per hour. I I found that to be ironic. Churches and labs were similar in the number (laughs) of air changes. Both groups do a lot of praying for the results. This, this is what I was actually (laughs) thinking. You know, there, we, we always, uh, you know, are hoping we hope I mean, how many times have we heard our graduate students hope that this experiment will work? And finally, classrooms have air change requirements of about three to four, which I recall from um, uh, TWIV 610 uh, that Kathy was talking about having to teach her classes fall in a much larger classroom because Mm -hmm. of um, the social distancing requirements. Michael, would you say that a lot of safety issues that you're going to be talking about were established in the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic when we didn't know how it was transmitted and everybody had to go to the dentist and obviously they had to take precautions and they actually took super precautions because when it was eventually found out it was transmitted by blood products instead of, you know, by just breathing. Um, They must have relaxed a little bit, but I think a lot of these issues had been addressed back in the 1980s, 1990s. Do you think so? I absolutely do. That was the great watershed year. I grew up in an era of wet-fingered dentistry. The first <laughs> yes, time I right. went to a dentist, they <laughs> used their bare hands to of do course. dentistry. <laughs> that that was that is affectionately referred to by the older faculty as wet-fingered <laughs> wet. Dentistry and the HIV epidemic literally. By, by the way, um, back back probably around the same time, there was wet fingered surgery going on. Yeah. Well. Oh yes. Just to put this in perspective. Yes. And it we that was our first time that we had a large active discussion about appropriate PPE. It's when many of the disposable gowns that dentists routinely wear today were um, put into place. And it's when dentists went from wearing short smocks to actually um, these disposable isolation gowns that we routinely now see in a dental office. So the dentist has been um, preparing for this for quite some time, but what they haven't done is they haven't been concerned about the air that they breathe because they thought that the high volume suction was effectively addressing much of the fomite that was being liberated from the oral cavity. Um, We've all had those saliva ejectors or what they are called, which is the original bendy straw that they hang on the side of your mouth when they're doing dentistry that literally sucks the life out of your mouth by removing all the saliva and you have that dry mouth sensation. And the salivary glands with them, by the way. Oh, yes. (laughs) Them too. Them them too. Uh, So, but I think what we have now learned with um, 
some studies that have been done in the past looking at biofilm liberation is that the dentists are now very much attuned to wearing face shields. And in fact, face shields actually will protect them because remember that the virus can actually wick its way down your tear duct into your nasal cavity. And so the face shield is is very important. Many of them have been uh, wearing um, uh, eye protection, but a lot of dentists wear loops, magnifying loops to effectively address their posture so that they don't have to stoop over the patient in order to work on their mouths. And of course, we've all experienced the, the chair, you know, the dental cush, the dental couch actually almost puts our head on the floor so that they're ergonomically adjusted so that they don't develop uh, workplace injuries due secondary to their neck bending over. And so face shields are one of the most important pieces of personal protective equipment that the dentist uh, needs to wear. In concert, we now know that N95 masks, because given that you are in uh, an environment with a large volume of air that may have energized particles for a long period of time, you need to protect yourself and be properly wearing an N95 mask, which in, in essence is a respirator of sorts because it will exclude 95% of the particulates that are being generated uh, as a consequence of the, the normal uh, procedures. You know, Michael, it's a shame that, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I just can't help thinking about the comparison of being a physician and being a dentist. And the physician, let's say you're a surgeon, and let's say you specialize in gallbladder operations. You can do that remotely. You can do that robotically. Yes. So you don't have any dentistry that can be done robotically? In China. the first robot really? The first robot dentists have been tried on... Uh, have been developed in China, um, and they are beginning to bring robots in into that space. And in fact, much of the, I think, as the gaming industry gets better with 3D games and haptic responses on gloves, I think that's when we're going to see that penetration into healthcare. Once the gaming industry, which has far greater depth in their pocket than does the dental industry, then I think we will see uh, that aspect moving into dentistry. And in fact, Dixon, you bring up a good point because right now, much of dental training is first conducted in the simulation laboratory. What most, what most folks don't appreciate is that dentistry is still an apprentice-based discipline. You are trained as an apprentice. So the first couple of years you're in dental school, you are effectively working on a mannequin, effectively learning how to first cut plastic teeth and then sure. eventually uh, extracted teeth. And ultimately, by the time you're a uh third year dental student, you're actually cutting a real tooth on a real individual all by yourself. Right. You've gone from and, yeah, the chalk stage, right? <laughs> oh, you've gone from the chalk stage. <laughs> and if you think about it, we rarely let medical students interact with patients beyond listening to their chests and taking their blood pressure. And so by the time you walk across a stage as a graduating dentist, you effectively are certified being able to practice independently. So they're sort of dropped into the deep end of the pool from day one when they attend school, knowing that in order to get out, they have to be able to do everything by themselves without supervision. So it's it's really um, a good thing. So... You know, what we need to do in order to go to the dentist, I know that I missed 
my uh, spring dental appointment because they stopped all but emergent dental care from occurring. And so my routine, yeah, me too. my routine cleaning was not done. And so I can feel the biofilm growing on my teeth, <laughs> even though I brush twice a day and I floss like a crazy man. Thank God for remote uh, podcasts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> remote podcast does help. help. So, what has happened is the American Dental Association, the CDC, the Chinese equivalent of the CDC have all begun to look about look at um, making dentistry safe. And one of the papers that I posted in the show notes for folks to read actually articulates what has been going on in China. Much of it concerns the transmission of the virus. It was written for dentists who may not be listening to this podcast. But it by the way, the China CDC is known as the China CDC. Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even by the people who speak Chinese. Even by the yes, I, they have Chinese words for it, but it's the their official name is the China CDC. I just thought I'd throw that in there. So yes, go ahead. All right. So um so the so what we have to help the dental community appreciate, and this is what Daniel has been doing great in helping the um, the routine physicians address how should they care for people, is we need to change our routine a little bit. And oftentimes when you would go to the dental office, the dentist would greet you, shake your hand, or if they really were taking care of you for years, they'd give you a hug. And that was a routine behavior. Right. So, and a lollipop. <laughs> well, they, they still probably are passing out candy. You know, job security. I want security. you to come back. <laughs> job security. Yes. That's exactly it. So I think, um, and, and this is, this all makes common sense. And so a lot of dental offices have been talking about how they need to uh, address things. So they have worked on the practitioners, namely the dentists and the hygienists and the dental technicians. They're effectively all gowned, gloved, and wearing face shields and respirators. If they're wearing, if they have facial hair, they of course have to be fit tested for their N95 with the appropriate level of facial hair, or they encourage them to remove the facial hair so they'll get an occlusive seal around that N95 respirator. But for the patients, what they're recommending is that the receptionist of the office call them ahead of time and effectively ask them about how well they have been feeling, whether or not they have had any influenza-like illnesses, or if they have been exposed to a COVID-19 individual uh, or they themselves have been a COVID-19 individual, there are specific steps that the uh, receptionist is effectively triaging them into categories of risk. And um, so then they come to the office, and then another individual will effectively take their temperature upon arrival. But here, you got to be careful in that you ask them, you haven't drunk that uh, McDonald's coffee, where you, all of a sudden your mouth is now boiling, and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden you have a temperature of 112 degrees, <laughs> and so you may get a false fever response. So, and again, or if you haven't drunk, uh, you know, consume the diet cola beverage that's been on ice in your car. So, um, you you just have to make sure that you have one of the infrared thermometers thermometers that can effectively give you a good um, body temp. You ask them to hand sanitize. You have the hand sanitizers throughout your office complex. And then what you do is just before the patient is ready to come back for the procedure, here you want to dilute the inoculum that may be present in the saliva by asking them to do a rinse. And this rinse is one and a half percent hydrogen peroxide. So the over-the-counter hydrogen peroxide, if you can find it at your local druggist, is about 3%. So you mix it 50-50 with water, and that'll give you 1.5%. You effectively swish it around your mouth for a full minute, and then you expectorate or spit it out. 
and um, you have now cut the load a sufficient level that the aerosol risk is not gone, but it's minimized so that you can safely do it. And the rule of thumb is the longer you anticipate you're going to be working on the patient, you may want to step aside and have them do another peroxide rinse because as you continue to express saliva because you got that bendy straw in your mouth sucking you dry, you're going to be putting in new virus into the oral cavity because we know the salivary epithelium can actually grow the virus. And so you may be continuing to shed virus. There are also dental products out there that um, the there's a product by Colgate called Proxel. And there's a product by Listerine uh, that's called the Listerine Whitening Mouth Rinse. And both of those have one and one and a half percent hydrogen peroxide. And again, time on target is uh, one minute. And in fact, the ADA and our CDC are only recommending in the United States peroxide to s- destroy the virus. I found that unusual <laughs> because I would have thought chlorhexidine would be one of the materials that may have been used because chlorhexidine has this propensity to stick to mucosal surfaces and it's been used a long time in the dental arena and chlorhexidine can kill nearly 100% of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria just by being in contact with mucosal surfaces for about 30 seconds. So if it can't how does it do against It viruses? works much faster because viruses are much wimpier than a God-fearing gram positive, <laughs> especially this virus, because it's just a wimpy envelope virus. And yeah, but, <laughs> but, yeah, but. Here's, here's, where the chi- here's where the Chinese CDC comes into play, because they had been using chlorhexidine uh to effectively decontaminate the oral cavity before they would intubate people with respirators. And the Chinese studies reported that what would happen if they had to intubate an individual, that this bisguanide or chlorhexidine, which disrupts the membrane of microbial cells, has received a contraindication because they have seen a number of ventilator-associated pneumonia pathogens have a reduced susceptibility to chlorhexidine, and consequently, they had a higher mortality in the in the intubated patients in China. So chlorhexidine is off the list. But I don't know. No one has done a study, to the best of my searching, looking at whether chlorhexidine could minis- minimize the concentration of virus in an aerosol. So that's a study I would challenge my dental colleagues out there who have the ability to detect virus, maybe one of the sham viruses or a pseudotyped virus to see whether or not um, chlorhexidine could knock it out. There are a couple of other uh, less, you know, nasty tasting things other than peroxide. There's uh, citrox, which is a formulation of a bioflavonoid obtained from citrus fruits. So it has a citrusy like, and it's a strong oxidant and it's, it's non-toxic. And these bioflavonoids are well documented to knock down bacterial loads. And here, this bioflavonoid citrox is thought to interfere with the coronaviral chiral chymotrypsin protease. So this bioflavonoid is actually a great protease inhibitor. So it, it, it's, a, it's another one that's out there. There's also a glucose, glucose derivative called an amphiphilic cyclodextrin. Uh, and it's got a rigid cyclic structure um, and it can dilute the concentration of oral microbes in saliva. And in the one paper that was in the journal of clinical medicine, they are actually advocating the combination of citrox and cyclodextrins together. Those combinations are available in Europe, but they haven't made it across the pond to the United States as yet to see. And 
the reason they're arguing for cyclodextrins is because uh, they're more friendly to dental materials already in your mouth, like silver or gold, and or or if you happen to use povidine iodine, povidine iodine will turn gold a dark brown. It will react with it, and so that's not very attractive. So, um, you know, they they are looking at um, those particular uh, activities. Uh, for controlling the concentration of virus that happens to be in saliva. So now we got the patient in the chair ready to work. Wait a minute. I have another question before you move on. All right. What about single malt scotch? Alcohol, (laughs) unfortunately, you... It needs to be at least uh, 132 132 proof. proof. Yeah. But it makes the patient more pliant with the... uh, uh, Bacardi 151. Yeah, might Bacardi be. Turkey, 151. Wild Turkey 101 might be. <laughs> well, again, um, you know, this is a envelope virus. Um, the alcohol hand gels were based, a lot of the studies were based on their ability to inactivate things like Staph, Staph aureus or other compounds, other microbes out there that are much more resilient. And since this is just a wimpy membrane envelope virus, um, it, it, you know, scotch could probably do the trick. But again, a study needs to be done, Vincent, if you're interested. But that's not an official recommendation. No, just no. no it's not an official recommendation. No, 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 no. no. Uh, uh, Dixon is going to volunteer to do the study next time he goes to the well, dentist. Well, it's just a good act of, uh, of kindness that the dentist could show for their patients by offering them a, a small uh, <laughs> entry well, uh, mouthwash that you could actually dentistry, swallow. Yeah. <laughs> And in fact, when dentistry was founded as a discipline, you either got gunpowder to clot clot the blood, and you got a shot of whiskey to pull before you, they pulled the tooth. That's right. That's right. That's um, right. So this this is old time religion. Now now that we have the patient in the chair, um, you want to minimize as best you can anything that will generate an aerosol. So this is where rubber dams come into place. And this is effectively um, a square of um, the material that they make um, the, the gloves out of. And it's generally perforated. So you put it over the tooth that you are going to work on. And so consequently, you have a dry field that you're working on and not mixing with the saliva and you have the saliva ejector effectively in the patient's mouth and it's running at high speed so they don't gag and choke. And you then would actually have another saliva ejector because the high speed handpiece is effectively using water to cool the burr uh, that is um, effectively doing what you need to get done. So, again, rubber dams are going to become um, ways of minimizing the aerosol production. And um, the other thing that dentists may want to consider is we routinely use bite wing x-rays where they put an x-ray plate inside your mouth on the surface of the tooth. And remember... Then the last time you were to the dentist, when you put this bite wing in and you're biting down on it, you're generating a lot of saliva. And so the bite wing actually becomes contaminated. So you got to consider that as a contaminant as you go in to develop the bite wing. And secondly, you may wish not to do the bite wing x-ray and you may want to use some other extra oral dental radiograph as a, a pancef or cone beam, something that the dentists may have in their office. Generally, um, endodontists have cone beams and pancefs are generally done by the orthodontist. We've all sat in that chair, anyone who's had orthodonture and had that x-ray machine circle our head. It's pretty, it's pretty freaky. So... Uh, so now that not we, very fun. 
Yes. So now that we gotten the patient in the chair and we're doing our dental procedure, you want to effectively uh, watch your time. And generally, dentists know how to um, book their appointments and, and they know. And you just have to effectively factor in how much saliva you've been pulling out. And we then need a study out there that actually will track how much virus is actually shed from the salivary epithelial layer per unit time. And we don't know that fact yet. I mean, but I think to err on the side of caution is if you're going to be in the chair for a long period of time, you may want to, you know, stop the care, do a peroxide rinse or one of these other compounds and effectively uh, deal with it in, in that particular way. So once the, the patient is done being cared for, uh, you again apply the um, peroxide to effectively have one last decon before they go out into the world. And then again, that's so that the patient, as they're walking through your office space, is not effectively contaminating as they're walking back to, to go on home. Now, now comes the hard part where you as the healthcare professional have to decontaminate your built environment. And so here is where you have to understand the disinfectants that you're using to routinely decontaminate the operatory. And you have to get a qualified industrial hygienist to at least, or a ventilation engineer to look at your airflow to effectively minimize the hazards to the waiting spaces and have the air flow out of the operatory out into the outside or a filtration system to somehow effectively move that material flow through. So you've minimized aerosol generation while you've been working on the patient through the introduction of the peroxide rinses as well as minimizing aerosol generation by, if necessary, use of the rubber dam, the saliva ejectors, and high-speed suction. And you need to read the, the label of the decontaminant or disinfectant that you are using to wipe down common touch surfaces. And remember, it goes everywhere, and that includes the disposable gown that you are wearing, that you doff it properly in the operatory where the patient is, and you not wear the same gown when you go see the patient in the cubicle next to him, because that gown is effectively contaminated. And so many dentists are going to have to rethink their PPE budget because oftentimes they would wear the same disposable gown all day and just toss them once a day. And again, we have to be more in a medical mindset where each operatory is in reality an isolation room in the hospital, where when you leave the isolation room, you, you doff, you take off your contaminated clothing, you put it into a biohazard bin, and similarly, you strip off your gloves the respirator you can probably leave on because it's already attached and, and doffing is where you, the individual, are at most at risk of contaminating yourself. And so... Now, where do the... Um, this may be more of a building engineering thing that varies between offices, but where do the vacuum lines lead for things like the saliva this extraction? Typically, they go up to the roof into a vacuum pump okay. and there's generally an oil sump that the stuff goes into. Right. And so I think the oil will likely inactivate any sure. of the virus, at least any of the SARS-CoV-2. I don't know about things like mycobacteria. And in fact, the, the water lines that routinely feed um, high-speed hand pieces uh, have been known to become contaminated with fast-growing species of mycobacteria. And in fact, that's an mm. occupational hazard that some dentists acquire 
a fast growing mycobacterial infection on their hand hand that uses the hand piece because of the splashback of the mycobacteria as well as Legionella nemophila. Legionella is known to be right. in it. And so mm-hmm. oftentimes the way that has been dealt with is through an engineering solution of using sterile water to effectively drive it. But again, mycobacteria and Legionella are capable of establishing biofilms in often these plastic water distribution systems. And so you may be actually squirting Legionella at the patient or mycobacteria at the patient. But again, the patient is able to routinely deal with that through their normal immune system, whereas the dentist is continuously exposed to it. And uh, a number of engineering solutions are being evaluated to uh, effectively control that aspect of things. Michael, how often do dentists get tested now for the the COVID-19? They haven't. Right now, they're- Isn't that a hazard also for the patients then? It it is indeed a hazard for the patient, but healthcare workers aren't routinely tested as part of the the standard of care. And and so um, I know that at my institution, we're going to test all of our healthcare professionals in the dental school that have routine contact with patient to understand. And then if they do become antigen positive, they're going to go into the uh, two week quarantine period and effectively wait it out to see whether or not they display symptoms. And we're also, I, I've been pushing to do now that the serology is being straightened out a little bit better that, um, we have a, um, we're, we're using one of the FDA cleared tests at my institution, and we're going to begin to look for IgG levels. And again, we don't know yet whether um, having IgG actually suggests that you're uh, resistant to a subsequent COVID infection. So, But it does show that you yes, were Yes, it does infected. indeed. Mike, Michael, um, you've uh, mentioned air handling as an issue, and I'm wondering whether there's any required certification of dental offices to have a certain, you know, uh, standard of air handling. The New York State has it in their design specs, and so when a dental office is inspected in New York State, they have to deliver the engineering diagrams to them. Um, I was talking to our chair of infection control yesterday, trying to chase down the South Carolina answer to your question. And I unfortunately don't have that answer. Okay. But I so know you don't New know York whether State. there's a, so uh, you uh, imply that, well, in New York, at least there is uh, some sort of inspection of dental offices to make sure that they meet a certain set of standards. Is that uh, going to be pretty much standard practice from state to state? I hope so. I honestly okay. don't know. Okay. Hmm. Some of this may also be handled in the building code. Yeah. It's probably handled that too. in the, the building code. I mean, mm-hmm. in New York State, I'm reading off of it's the design submission requirements for, and it's uh, the Center for Healthcare Facility Planning Licensure and Finance out of the Bureau of Architecture and Engineering Review for New York State's Department of Health. And I would, uh, I would assume that under these circumstances, the standard practice of, that we're all familiar with, of uh, the doctor or hygienist going from patient to patient and kind of cycling around so that uh, in a given visit, you may see a hygienist or a doctor who during the course of your visit has seen other patients. That's got to stop. Yep. And, and is that, uh, is that, is the ADA or some uh, other body uh, making recommendations in that regard? Or is I it have, just. I uh, have not seen that as yet because right now the only thing that's being recommended is emergent dental care where they were seeing very few patients. Um, dentistry, however, has been declared in some states an essential service. And so they are free to open. And 
I would just hope that the dental profession appreciates the risk of what they are doing and they know better than mer- most about how much energy is being imparted by those high speed hand pieces, whether they're air driven or electric drives. Before uh, uh, Michael, before this became uh, a serious uh, pandemic, uh, but but after it became an epidemic, um, there must have been lots of people that were asymptomatic that went to the dentist. Uh, do we have any statistics on how many dental hygienists and dentists have become infected with uh, this uh, virus? Not in the United States, but the in that Chinese paper from the Journal of Dental Research that I that are that's in the show notes they do comment on how many of their um colleagues uh 169 of their staff involved in the duty of dental emergency have treated over 700 patients with the emergent treatment needs since january 24th under the premise of adequate protection measures and um you know, they describe and, and they tell you in their table how many um, people, I believe, were, are are there any cases of contacts infected? So, uh, it looks like, I'm going to have to, I don't recall the statistic off the top of my head. So, you mentioned that all the ways that dentistry had changed because of the HIV epidemic um, and the ending of wet finger dentistry. Um, do you think that some of these changes will sort of stick around long term? And how do you think we might see changes in dentistry going forward? I think what we're going to see is uh, a reinvention of the face shield to effectively allow for the incorporation of lenses from dental loops into face shields, um, where they'll be able to effectively plug and play their lenses into their loops and the face shield is, is, um, uh, going to become ubiquitous. Some dentists routinely have been using face shields, whereas many were just wearing, um, a, their loops that were embedded into, um, uh, the equivalent of lab safety glasses where there's side shields and, it didn't really control the splatter that, and in fact, there have been studies done where they actually measure the biofilm that's smashing against the face shield all over the face shield. And they were able to get, you know, large colony counts off of the face shield. We had a, we had a letter from a dentist and a professor of dentistry at university of Illinois, Yana, and she sent in, a bunch of questions. I think many you addressed. I mean, I think, have there been known incidents of transmission via dental office? I'm guessing we don't know, right? It's too early to tell. Now that we're opening up, I think the second wave is going to begin to tell us that. And that's why okay. I I think it's it's very important that we begin to institute the hydrogen peroxide rinsing or some strong oxidant that can disrupt um, this virus in a very yeah. quick manner because most people can swish stuff in their mouths for a minute um, and it will effectively really drop the load. And, you know, on, on your last TWIV with Dr. Weiss, um, you asked her the hard question of how many, how is messenger RNA levels related to infectious viruses? And I think if we had that number, we would be able to refine some of these safety measures because the only way we can do it easily is by effectively looking for those three primer targets that are in the CDC's current antigen test. We're not culturing virus because you need a level three lab and there are very few level three labs across the country. And most dentists out in private practice don't have any access whatsoever to a level three facility to be able to address these questions. She had also asked a variety of questions about effectiveness of all the things you talked about. But again, I don't think we know, right? No. You know, peroxide, we- air purifiers, PPE. We have no idea. No. Um, we do know that... Um, 
that ultraviolet light will inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but the problem with ultraviolet light is shadowing. And it effectively takes time. Often it's measured in hours. And most dentists don't want to sacrifice an operatory for hours <laughs> and in order to effectively turn it over for patients unless their patient volume has really dropped down because that dental chair is a substantial amateuris- amateurization asset that they have to write off because those things aren't cheap. How, how, maybe you don't know this, but like, how, how do dentists work? Are they just on the edge of profit? Do they make a ton of money? Do they lose money? Where are we? I guess you have to count the boats in their driveway. Uh, or the <laughs> islands off the coast of Georgia. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think my daughter's orthodontist is doing fine, but it probably yeah, yeah, no, I would agree. Like implants uh, see a lot of business, but I'm cavity wondering filling is not such a big deal anymore. Wondering if a lot are going to go out of business, you know, because of this. It's a, it yeah, sure it's is. a very good question because sure I know a lot is. in medicine, a lot of uh, internists and pediatricians are barely staying afloat. Were barely staying afloat yeah. before this all. And, and their coworkers are their uh, dental hygienists and uh, the receptionist and all those poor right. people are going to be out on the street. I'm afraid these these are truly small businesses because you know one yeah. of the courses they take at the end of dental school is practice management and they have to worry about payroll and. HR and right. everything under the taxes. sun. Taxes. <laughs> yeah. Taxes. Oh, yeah. Here at Microbe TV, I don't have to worry about payroll. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> I, I was on a call last week with theater owners. Oh, you know, oh my. And oh. not just movies, but you know, live acting, plays. Sure. Mm-hmm. And they said to yeah. me, you know, even when we have 100% of the seats occupied we still lose money we need to have donations to exist and so to, to say 25 percent of capacity they're going to go out of business wow. be a, too bad yeah michael that was great thank you so much Absolutely. oh you're welcome let's uh, do some emails stick around michael is that okay with you can you stay that's you fine can with me i can stay drill, drill some teeth all right so look we this week <laughs> The main topics of email were Judy Mikovits and yes. artificially right. made or laboratory released viruses. But this email from Nicholas uh, all addresses um, how to deal with the idea that uh, SARS-CoV-2 came from a laboratory in an easy to understand language. This is great. And he writes, roughly speaking, a 96.2% identity between RATG13, that's the bat virus that's closest, and SARS-CoV-2, still means that there are over a thousand differences between these viruses. So you would have to really know what you were doing to make a thousand changes to a virus and not mess it up completely. (laughs) Whoever did this, hypothetically, must be light years ahead of the best virologists in the world. That's right. (laughs) And then he has a paper. Yes, go ahead. I was going to say, I think on our last episode, um, someone had asked us to explain things in um, language that they could understand. Um, And so here, Nicholas is doing a much better job than I think (laughs) we we did did. with our tribes. Yeah, we wandered off into the weeds of Nerdsville uh, (laughs) real quickly. (laughs) Uh, Then he he sends a link to a paper where they study the synonymous mutations between the bat virus, the pangolin virus, and SARS-CoV-2. These are the changes that do not uh, make a coding difference, do not make an amino acid difference. As you mentioned in your discussion, if you were to design a deadly coronavirus in the lab, you wouldn't bother including synonymous mutations as they would make your work harder and wouldn't have any effect. (laughs) Exactly. That's perfect. (laughs) The authors also identify that there are non-synonymous mutations in SARS-CoV-2 genome that are actually predicted to reduce fitness. Would you include those if you were designing this? Those are mutations that would lead to amino acid changes. Only if you're planning a conspiracy theory. (laughs) That's right. Right. This is a big conspiracy theory at this point. We're deep, deep, deep into that at this point, yeah. As a bonus, they also kill the idea that this was a virus that was cultured in a lab for years and acquired these mutations spontaneously as they show that the last common ancestor between SARS-CoV-2 and the bat and pangolin viruses was upwards of 30 
years ago. So the bottom line. I think line, that's before the Wuhan lab was built. The bottom line for non-specialists. One, there are over a thousand changes between SARS-CoV-2 and the closest coronavirus we know of. Many do nothing. Some actually make the virus worse at infecting people and some presumably make it better. Although we can technically recreate the genome of SARS-CoV-2 in a lab, no human we, would be capable of designing this without messing it up. And two, the virus did not evolve these thousand changes through culturing in a lab because this would take over 30 years. And in the 1980s, we had no idea that there were coronavirus in bats that could infect you. We barely knew there were bats. And nobody would have funded it. Yeah. So I, Very well. Very well done, Nicholas. Thank you. Nice yeah. job, Nicholas. Really good. And uh, I will use those arguments now moving forward. He did a better job than we did, I hate to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, that's um, Professor Nicholas Hawk. Um, Yes, who is at uh, the department, looks like Department of Biochemistry. This is in Portuguese, so I'm trying to <laughs> mentally he's translate and I don't speak it uh, at uh, I IQ USP in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Good. Brianne, can you take uh, Megan's? Sure. Megan writes, hi, Twiv team. I'm listening to 610 and I had to pause and write some of my own plain language summaries for your listeners' questions. I worked on a fish virus that no one cared about while getting my PhD and now work in medical writing. All right, good. We have another attempt here. We know the new coronavirus was not made in a lab because we don't have the ability to design viruses out of the blue. Viruses are made of chains of thousands of amino acids. Think of them like the parts of a Lego kit that have different shapes. If you swap out too many pieces of that kit, the end design doesn't look like what you'd hoped for. Virologists can alter viruses, but with our current knowledge, creating one this different is like grabbing random Legos out of a bucket and trying to build something while blindfolded. <laughs> Second, the new coronavirus doesn't change like the flu. We know this because the flu and COVID-19 are different types of viruses. Virus types are determined by how they store their genetic information. The flu has its genetic materials in a puzzle-like fashion, with interchangeable pieces. Each year, different combinations are spread around, and thus we need a new flu shot to match the combinations in production. Coronaviruses, on the other hand, only keep all of their genetic information in a single piece, and thus cannot swap the information like the flu virus. Thanks, Megan. That was great. And I really like Megan's PS, who... Give oh, yes. a shout out to her dad who now complains, I'm interrupting Twiv time every time there's a new episode. <laughs> <Good. laughs> these are really great, Megan. I think that these are fabulous uh, jobs. And, and by the way, working on a fish virus no one cared about, um, you know, 20 years ago, no one cared about coronavirus. Sure, right. Indeed. So, so. If that Just was a fish there. virus that affects salmon, then everybody cares about it. <laughs> everybody would. I wrote salmon and I salmon anemia right. virus is you. That's right. That's right. I wrote to Megan and I said, anytime you hear us saying something that's not clear, you can go ahead and send one of your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. If you'd like to come to my class and translate for me, it would be really helpful. <laughs> Rich, can you take uh, the next one? Sure. Uh, uh, this is from Aubrey, who starts out by uh, uh, saying she's just a housewife with no medical background. The, uh, the just bit is nobody is just anything. At any rate, she yeah. lavishes praise on us and then says, I have a question specifically for Dr. Condit. I live in Killeen, about 50 miles from Austin. I was sick in January, and many of my symptoms make it seem quite possible that I may have had a mild case of COVID-19. I did not have to go to a doctor, and I didn't have the means either way, and I didn't have the means to either way. Uh, is anyone doing prior case antibody testing in our area that might want to test my blood for research purposes? I would love to be helpful to science in this way if possible, and I could go to Austin if uh, need be to do this. Well, I did my homework and previewed uh, the... Um, emails before going on the air, and my first reaction to this was to write to Jason McClellan at UT, uh, uh, who has uh, published a structure of the coronavirus spike protein and has been in the news lately for their work on studying um, camelid antibodies 
you've read this in the news as antibodies from llamas are going to save us all. Um, <laughs> and I thought he might have some insight into this. And he wrote me back right away and suggested I contact another individual at uh, UT who is looking at uh, antibody responses in humans. And this person might be interested. So Vincent, if you could send me Aubrey's email address, I will uh, forward Jason McClellan's uh, email to Aubrey with this other individual's contact in it and see if anything comes of it. Uh, one of the other things that has been in the news this week is uh, Judy Mikovits, um, who uh, listeners may remember from XMRV days. So um, we have a bunch of email, but... And new listeners, new listeners who want to really delve into this saga can go back to episode wow. 136 and references therein and earlier episodes. And we, we actually followed this whole thing from beginning to. And in fact, it's uh, this, if you were wanted to go through this entire arc, it is a wonderful example of how science works. And it's, uh, and it's self-correcting yes. uh, nature because in the beginning, Yes. Uh, of this, it would looked as if there might be something really cool going on, and it turned out to be uh, a collision of uh, uncool things going on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, collision that of it, uncool things. Uh, that it took a lot of people yes. a long time to figure out. And by the way, I actually did my homework on this as well and re- uh, actually watched that half an hour trailer. On Plandemic, yeah. I'm sorry. And I have to say that uh, her name uh, was pronounced in the trailer as Mikovitz. Hmm. Okay? So huh. I had not, we've always uh, pronounced it Mikovitz, but it must be, it must we be stand that corrected. the correct Mikovitz. pronunciation is Mikovitz. All right. Anyway, with. And that is the only favor the, uh, we will be doing her here. The bottom line of the, the X, so XMRV was suggested to play some role in the disease chronic fatigue syndrome. And, uh, and, prostate and also cancer. prostate cancer. And this, and, is a re- this is a retrovirus. And at, at yeah. a certain point in this investigation, which engaged many, many people, it was a big deal, right? The patients, the virology community, clinicians, because finding a virus causing uh, ME-CFS would be a big deal. And finding anything out- that was the cause of ME-CFS would be yeah. really helpful to the community. Yeah. So it turned out the virus was a contaminant. Uh, it was actually a, an artifact produced in in uh, in the laboratory. Had nothing to do. That is an virus. <laughs> it was made, was in made the by uh, passaging cells in mice, um, and so. But Mikov- Mikovitz uh, clung to the belief that it was in, the virus was involved, and she published some papers which had to be retracted because they were fraudulent. The, the data were manipulated. She ended up losing her job, and so this is a person who is not. A, um, a good interpreter of of scientific data, I would say, and has really been disgraced after that. Although she continues to uh, c- to insist that there's some virus in, in MECFS, and she has many followers who believe in her. So now, and that's not to discount the general notion that there may be some virus involved in MECFS, but I would not take Mikovitz's no. Word I mean, for and anything. you know, it just needs to be found. And I, I think actually. Yeah, the the Wikipedia page on her is quite it's good. It's straightforward, factual, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it starts off, Judy Ann Mikovits uh, is an American anti-vaccination activist, conspiracy theorist, and ex-research <laughs> scientist. She's made discredited claims about vaccines, coronavirus, and chronic fatigue syndrome, and goes on and tells the history of uh, XMRV and CFS and the coronavirus conspiracy theories that we're now getting letters about. Um, so she has she's apparently the star of this new um, little documentary that they threw together, um, making all sorts of wild claims about how how SARS-CoV-2 is some sort of big conspiracy. And it is it is absolute rubbish um, and coming from a source who nobody should taken be off the air believing for anything. It has. It has been taken off YouTube, but the website and, and can't be what 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 is astounding so. to me is that this video is getting millions of views, 
when you know p perfectly accurate and reputable videos get get far less but such is the nature of uh, fake science well, i guess they they're sort of plugging it as she's someone who used to work with fauci so she knows yeah. <laughs> so um we got a bunch of letters, which will all be in the show notes. You can look at there. There are others. I'd like this one, Nick. He said, can you address this or are all you all part of the deep state? <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> then he says, wink, wink. <laughs> yes. Um, but she trashes Fauci in this. I have seen the floor. And then yeah. Anthony uh, sent a um, rebut a point by point rebuttal by someone else. Uh, on the website Think Big, and he goes through all the points about her anti-vax stance. This and this is one I wanted to point yeah. out. She says that uh, this is a product of a failed uh, t t flu vaccine of the Department of Defense. Uh -huh. So let me just read this one little bit. The Mikovits links Mikovits links COVID nineteen with flu vaccine based on a January twenty twenty study of the DoD personnel. Indeed, getting the flu vaccine appeared to result and an increased risk of being infected with a coronavirus. The problem the coronavirus studied was the common cold variety, not SARS-CoV-2. <sighs> the study was also based on one flu season. A previous larger study covering six flu seasons found no such association. So in the film, you are led to believe that getting a flu vaccine increases your risk of getting SARS-CoV-2. There's no evidence of that. So, so it's a st standard, standard uh, sort of fake science uh, tactic of cherry yeah. picking. Uh, exactly. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different points here, and they're all well done. We'll put a link to it so you can have a, a look. They're all just wrong and easily refutable. And, you know, we don't need to spend the time, I think, no. because it's been no. done here very well. The problem with this sort of thing is there is there's a certain comfort in conspiracy theories, right? Because they would mean that somebody's right. actually in charge. And that for for a lot of people and, and I can see where they're coming from. That is actually even if the people in charge are malevolent, that's better than acknowledging that we live in a chaotic universe that doesn't give a damn about us. Which yeah, is a terrifying great. thought, <laughs> but is actually true. And so people in a moment like this, especially amid all this uncertainty, they want definitive answers and they want answers that indicate that there's some logic to it. And this gives that. It says, OK, it's being done by these evil conspirators and that's the source of the problem. But. It's an interesting. It's way just not. At it. Yeah, it's really uh, that's uh, that's really great. I mean, scientists uh, are uh, practiced in not knowing stuff, believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, and we're yeah. comfortable with not knowing. That's our business, you know. I don't know this. Let's go figure it out. Uh, and uh, that's yeah. not uh, that makes some people uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, I when I listened to this uh, today, I had out a pen and paper because I was going to take notes and write down the <laughs> things that uh, were wrong about it, and uh, I gave up about two minutes into it because because <laughs> everything was That's wrong. exactly right. <laughs> Everything's wrong. All yes. Right. Well, this whoever wrote this this uh, article did a good job. Yeah. So we refer to that, and now uh, Dixon, if you scroll down to Johnny's, can you read Johnny's? Johnny's yes, I passed him to this word. Dearest all, Twiv one uh, six ten. Professor Irwin's letter reminded me of a quote most commonly attributed to Jonathan Swift from Gulliver's Travels: "You cannot reason someone out of something he or she was not reasoned into." That's a wonderful quote. I like that very much. Good. Practically speaking, at this time, the presumption is that SARS-CoV-2 is ubiquitous. It doesn't matter whether its origin was in vivo and found in bats or in vitro and made in a test tube. It exists, and it is here. Conspiracy theories, in my opinion, are fiction and a distraction from the work at hand, thinking ahead and finding solutions. You are either part of the solution to this pandemic or dead weight and ipso facto become part of the problem. Wonderful emails and food for thought. Aluna continua, the struggle continues. Al uh, Amilcar Cabral, that was another quote. And then finally, maintain the best of health. That's a wonderful thing to wish for somebody. Uh, Johnny in Boston, where it's uh, 12 degrees yeah. C, cloudy, and a chance of rain. 
Johnny's our pediatrician friend in Cambridge, uh, who, whose office I have visited. Yes. And uh, actually, as I read this, um, I remember the quote often attributed to uh, Ted Turner, but I think that's a misattribution. But the quote remains good. Either lead, follow, or get out of the way. All right. That sounds yeah. like Ted Turner. <laughs> sounds like General Patton. <laughs> Alan, could you take the, the next one? Sure. Uh, Paul writes, Twivers, free citizens of the Republic of Science and Enlightenment. Aristotle argued that any free citizen who did not experience thumos, ranging from anger to grumpiness, when encountering injustice, was not virtuous. It was basically a duty of a citizen to be grumpy. If you were not, if you were acting rationally and emotional, uh, if not, you were acting rationally and emotionally as a slave. Of course, I understand that these words carried a different meaning 2,500 years ago. His point still stands. Keep up the good work. But stay grumpy. <laughs> a professor of anthropology, uh, that, thank you. by the way. Yeah, Paul is a pr professor of anthropology emeritus at UC Berkeley. So thank you very much. I'm remembering that for all my future grumpiness. Michael, would you like to read one? You got sure, the notes? I'll, I'll take Andreas. Andreas writes, I do not find it a bit uninformed to say that Sweden has done nothing. Sweden is actually doing more or less what you asked for in the show. Try to keep an infection at a rate where the healthcare system can cope with the ones who get ill and at the same time, not let the country totally grind to a standstill. We'll not write a long story about the situation here, but that's the plan. High death rates have mainly been connected to senior homes and home care, which has been a failure and is probably connected to how that care has been organized in the non-existing stocks of PPE. Schools haven't been closed. Secondary and university has only been online the last month. And yet there are no deaths in the people under 30. So I guess your discussion about opening schools has some backing. Well, anyway, thanks for an interesting podcast. Smiley face. Mm. Best regards, Andreas. Okay, so um, the next one is from Mats, who gives a little more detail on the same situation. And Mats was ever so slightly offended <laughs> by our comment that we're, Sweden is doing nothing. This is see the nice thing about angering the Swedes. Yeah, is well, there's a touch of yeah. um, angst in that. Uh... <laughs> well, he said, you know, I'm, yes. I'm ever so slightly offended. I love it. It's great. Just so and you so know, actually, Matt's, uh, Paul thinks that you should be grumpy. So that's fine. It's right. Yes, that's fine. Um, this is not true. We're actually doing quite a lot, just not as much and not the exact same things. All right. The government has prohibited any public gatherings over 50 people. You know, all universities have moved more or less to online teaching. High school grade 10, 12 has also moved to online. Everyone who can work home is encouraged to do so. Elementary schools and daycare centers remain open. Hmm. So that helps the parents yes, for sure, by, right? By far. Public sure. health agency has daily press briefings about the situation. They always repeat the same recommendations. If you're sick, stay home, avoid unnecessary travel, flatten the curve, do not overburden the health system, protect the vulnerable. Um, despite all this, travel during Easter weekend fell by 90%. Restaurants have closed every second table. Stores have installed plastic screens in front of the cashier, tape markings on the floor to mark proper distance. In my workplace, a university, more than 90% of staff are working from home. Most people I know avoid visiting older relatives. The public health agency is not currently encouraging the use of masks in public for this. They cite a lack of evidence. The agency also tones down the role for pre or, or asymptomatic spread. So far, we have 3,000 deaths, 25,000 reported cases with a steady pace of 500 new cases per day has been stable since early April. However, the public health agency has calculated the real number of cases is likely to be 75 times the reported number. Based on random sampling for SARS-CoV-2 a few weeks ago in Stockholm and a few recent Sero surveys, public health agency has calculated that about 30% of the population in Stockholm will have had the infection by the end of next week. Our hospital system is strained but not overwhelmed. Thus far, there have been 20% free capacity in ICUs. Of those discharged from ICU, 80% have survived. A large proportion of deaths have been in nursing homes. 
the strategy, albeit not ever clearly stated, seems to be to let the epidemic run its course, but at a pace that the health system can keep up with, the capital seems to be well underway. And 30% is pretty good so far. Yeah. Speaking of survival, by the way, uh, Daniel noted to me this morning that his Irish patient that he's been reporting on in the he went home. He's fine. Yeah, all right. Good. Oh, Excellent. good. Isn't that great? That's right. Raise the glass. Uh, right so this uh, letter from Matt's, I think, is great. And I really uh, appreciate this information. Yes. And it makes me think, you know, we're going to learn so much from this. And I hope we can actually, you know, compare all these circumstances in all these different places and uh, take a, a more strategic approach uh, for when this happens next time. Well, and it's something occurred to me with this. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't on last episode, but uh, I've previously said that Sweden's approach seemed a little reckless. But what I'm realizing now is in in the U.S. and in other countries, we need to have government agencies come forward and say, OK, people stay home. Um, you know, we're closing all these businesses, so there's no reason to leave home and, and take an active measure here. And it sounds like the Swedes are doing a lot of the same things voluntarily and just don't yeah. need to be told, um, which kind of changes what the government needs to do. I, I'm a little disturbed about the low testing rate. Um, but uh, the other thing that comes up here is their hospital capacity, their healthcare system is obviously a whole lot more robust than a lot of other countries. And so it may just be the case that they can get away with doing this because they've got space and they can take care of these people. And an 80 percent survival rate for people out of the ICU with this, this disease is is pretty much the inverse of what a lot yeah. of other places are seeing. So so, you know, yeah, maybe if you're Sweden, it's possible. you can do this. Yeah, yeah but. The, you have to add a caveat here, I think, Alan, and that is in this country, especially among the poor um, people of color, uh, older men, it would never work in this country. It just, just, just oh, in the U.S., this would never work. This would not. This would be completely no. This would be completely irresponsible and insane in the United States. But well, yes, um, but. But I think what this what this highlights is the difference in capacity and and capability and public education in different countries. And one needs to adapt to that differently. And, you know, maybe we ought to try and make our health care system a little better for next time so we don't have to close well, the one, of, down. one of the elements that's absent is the effect on human behavior that access to free health care offers you go more I mean, often that's yes a, right yes i mean if you know that health care is going to be there are you going to go or you're only going to go when you absolutely need it and i think the swedes have done an outstanding job not to 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 effectively deal with the hypochondria and you know it's it's going to be reflected in that site that uh, Rich mentioned yesterday the Oxford site that looks at the case fatality rate because Sweden has really right. done an experiment for us. You know, their, their social distancing requirements and their economy staying, if you will, half up um, isn't going to enable us to see what consequence that had on a nation. And so it's yeah. it's going to be interesting, and there are going to be a lot of papers written after we get through the first and second wave of this virus. Yeah, you've got two other examples, too, yeah. obviously. You've got New Zealand and then the small country mm -hmm. of Iceland to look at. But those are all monocultures of sure. similar people with a very low ethnicity diversion, uh, except for the Maori in, Sweden, in uh, New Zealand, by the way. Um, but we've got uh, a terrible thing going on right now in the Four Corners region of the United States with regards to the Navajo Nation, for instance. Um, and uh, you know, those, those people's yes. health have been neglected for centuries. And it's this is the way to see what happens when you do that. I'm afraid to say it, but I mean, all of the ills of um, of of a bad diet and poor lifestyle catch up to those people first. And those are the ones we hear about. And it's just, I don't know what to do about that. 
that's a so systemic change that you need to make at the very beginning. Uh, who's going to take the you lead know, on that one? I remember the Clintons, when they came in, they tried to do something, and I, of course they tried well, to ram it down their throats, and that didn't work either. Yeah, this gets into this gets into much, much bigger issues very fast. No, yeah. right. Unfortunately, we can't create the Swedish system no, overnight. No. no. Right, and that's the problem. No. No, this is this is uh, sort of a professional driver on yeah. closed course type of thing. You you, you have to build this whole thing in advance. Uh, but it, it's it's quite interesting also to look at what's happening in Russia right now because in the very beginning of this outbreak, Russia had nothing, and you know you figure in a totalitarian state where you say don't do that and then they don't do it. That's not happening in Russia. They're they're number five right now and they're creeping up on number three. So it's it's very interesting to see what's. Uh, the the, the um, infrastructure of countries largely determines what's going to happen. And uh, countries whose health systems was were sicker going into this are uh, they yeah. they have pre existing conditions yeah. like we That's do. That's right. That's yeah. right. Hmm. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Sherry writes, "I live in Brooklyn and spend three weeks knocked flat by COVID nineteen. I pass the time in bed with a marathon of microbe TV podcasts." The first thing I did when I was better, when I got better, was hug my children and then contribute to your Patreon. Thank, Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, and glad to have you. Glad to have you among yeah, the living. Glad that you're feeling better. Um, now that it seems clear, asymptomatic COVID nineteen was circulating in early February. Has anyone re-examined respiratory virus outbreaks on college campuses right after students returned from winter break? Hmm. My daughter is a freshman at Cornell. She was diagnosed with an upper respiratory infection, not flu, the first week of February. Fever of 104, chest pain, coughing. It lasted four to five days. The same virus ripped through the dorms. Tons of kids got sick, some being taken out on stretchers. Hmm. This would coincide with international students from China, including Wuhan, and Europe returning to school. I know other campuses experienced similar waves of disease. Wondering if this cohort of kids might make an interesting antibody study, especially as colleges discuss reopening fall. Mm -hmm. sure. yep. uh, yeah, definitely. Um, P.S. I'm a writer and my second novel was about the 1832 outbreak of cholera morbus in Sunderland, England and the fruitlessness of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> so these are great studies, which clearly have not yet been done because the serological tests are just rolling out, but they will be. Oh, yeah. there'll be as yeah. Michael said, there'll be lots of papers on this outbreak. Yeah. Oh yeah. My recollection from Drew was that um at the beginning of the semester, uh, we were frequently saying, There's some weird stuff going around. Mm. Yep. And that's about and it. And you were right. We'll see it was here and <laughs> there we'll see it was here minimum December, maybe even yeah, that's before. Right. That's right. You know. Wouldn't it be ironic? Now, Rick, wouldn't it be yes. ironic if SARS-CoV-2 came out of Kansas like 1918 <laughs> flu? <laughs> yeah. No, the bats don't have SARS-related viruses there. But that's where it did came from. But they called Spanish flu. Wow, that's right. right. That's right. Uh, Rich, you're next. Paul writes. Hi. In response to how you can tell, know what a bird looks like. Know what a plane looks like. How close can humans get to making a plane look like a bird? From far away, sure, maybe we can. Up close, the difference is obvious. Do I even need to explain what this is in response to? <laughs> Thanks for the great shows. You're all the best, Paul. It's good. You can tell when it was made by I, humans. I like yes. the analogy. Yep. Very good. Uh, Dixon. Anthony writes, uh, coronaviruses, this is a quote, coronaviruses can remain infectious for long periods in water and pasteurized settled sewage, suggesting contaminated water is a potential vehicle for human exposure if aerosols are generated, end quotes. Then he asks, um, subject to drying in UV, SARS-CoV-2 probably won't make it across the street, much less across the Pacific. Water contaminated with sewage can reach the clouds via droplets on the wind and or water spouts. In clouds, viruses can be in a wet, cold, UV-protected environment. I don't know how far clouds can travel. Cats will drink rainwater. <laughs> clouds can go pretty far, can't they? I think, yeah. hmm. and cats also get yeah. It, 
this this um i mean what you're getting at is could the clouds could the clouds yeah. carry sars cov2 around it it seems like quite a stretch yeah i think that Someone was asked last time if last yeah a, an important episode. thing to remember about clouds is that they don't stay they're i mean they're not only moving they're changing shape they're changing form they're towering up into the stratosphere and dissipating then they're you know just going through all sorts of changes all the time um and I wouldn't expect the I wouldn't expect the virus to stay in water protected from UV um, for very long if it were if 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 it was evaporated in an infectious form into a cloud in the first place. Uh, Alan, you are next. Okay, Margaret uh, writes. I listen to four hours a week and fully understand about thirty minutes a week. So there's that. I've been getting the impression, however, this would not be the case. Multiple strains of SARS-CoV-2 causing starkly different pathology and clinical outcomes. Uh, This article, I think, from USA Today, though I see it popping up in a lot of local newspapers, says the clinical outcomes between San Francisco and New York are stark. Um, Doctor in San Francisco claims 80% of patients on ventilators in New York died, whereas only two out of how many at his hospital died. He believes this may be explained by two different strains of SARS-CoV-2, one in San Francisco, a different one in New York. Um, And uh, says it's uh, rumble time in my family. My sisters say, what do you think about that? Huh? You think we can't read or something? You think we're so you're so great? Huh? Take that to your twib buddies. (laughs) We've got scientists, too. We can read, too. What about these scientists? These seem like some good scientists. And then some citations uh, talking about strain differences. Uh, I think these uh, um, are likely taken out of context. Who knows? This is science journalism. This is what you're up against. Yeah, so it's not different strains. It's different situations and different levels of testing. And, um, uh, yeah, this is... um, Different, so, you know, comor- different comorbidities. Different, different comorbidities. Different comorbidities. Yes. Totally. I mean, this is apples and oranges. You can't compare without doing a proper study right. of all the uh, things that might be confounding. I mean, this is easy to blame the genome. That's what I always say. It's really easy to not really think too hard and blame the genome. I had an email exchange uh, a few weeks ago about this issue. An, an MD in New York City wrote me and he said, Is it possible that? you know, genome mutation could explain this difference. And I said, it's highly unlikely. We don't know there. And all the things we've said, unlikely. And he said, yes. And he wrote back, yes, but could the genomes be different? (laughs) And I am not answering because every virus that comes out of you is different from the next one. What's the point in answering that, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, a a nicer way of putting this MD-PhD divide is um, doctors and scientists approach the world differently. Yeah, doctors are very interested in treating individual patients, and that's the priority, yeah. and it, it should be the priority. Scientists are interested in natural phenomena, which is a whole different question. And here, where you're talking about different virus strains, that's natural phenomena. That's our wheelhouse. And the answer is, no, these sequences are not different enough to be called strains, and this is not what's going on. Um, and from the doctor's perspective, they're looking at individuals and saying, well, these individuals in San Francisco did better than these individuals in New York, but that's why you need science to do a controlled trial and say, did you control for differences in comorbidities? Did you control for differences in protocols at the two locations, et cetera, et cetera? And there's where you're going to find your answers. I just want to make one comment. There is one strain of SARS-CoV-2 and many, many patient isolates that have different sequences, but there's only one strain. They all have similar properties as far as we can tell. Yes, uh, um, Michael, please do. What is it, Ben? Uh, well, I was looking at the UVC light. Uh, Greg writes. Go ahead. You could, you could do the Brenner thing. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So um, Greg writes, Dear TWIV crew, in TWIV 606, one of you warmed about the harmful nature of UVC light. I wonder if you would comment on FAR UVC light, light, which David Brenner at Columbia University says is safe for humans, but inactivates the virus. 
they give a uh, listing to a news story out of Columbia. He envisions far UVC lamps in public places to reduce the spread. Thanks for your efforts to educate me and others. Best Gregory from Champaign or Champaign, Illinois. So UVC light is spooky. It's, it's, uh, and far UVC light is, um, in, a wavelength of 207 to 222 nanometers. And that pretty much uh, is, you know, toxic to humans. I mean, you'll get a fairly good burn with that far UVC light. I I haven't looked at the Columbia News Store. Uh, Vincent, did do you know of the Columbia News Right. So um, if I could just take this, um, I'm the one on 606 who was who was uh, warning people not to buy a UVC bulb um, because these things are really nasty Um, Far this far UVC. So if you if you buy a UVC lamp, this is going to come off Amazon for uh, I don't know how much, but uh, and you shine that on your skin, it is going to nuke your skin. It's going to damage plastic near it. I mean, it's going to blind you if you look into it. These are these are not things you want to just play with. Uh, This right. So this far UVC is um, it looks like they're using really, really short wavelengths from 205 to 230 nanometers. And apparently, and this based on the Columbia News release, and I don't have the paper, but um, they are claiming that this kills viruses and bacteria in the air, but are not is not able to damage human cells. And I would need to see where the publication is. Um, actually, there's okay. We good. Uh, they seem to have handled this properly. There is a link to it's in nature research. Um, it is in nature David's research. David's a good researcher. I know uh, him personally. I, I trust. Yeah, him. And I I'm thinking this is so. This does look like this does look like a legitimate approach. Um, right. So this is um, we can put the link in the we can put the link in the show note. Um, this looks like a valid approach. It's um, five hundred to a thousand dollars per lamp. Um, so this is not something that you're going to be installing in large scale. Um, it, it seems like an approach that might be worth looking at, but again, the a big problem with UV is shadowing. So you might expose the top of somebody's head quite thoroughly and disinfect their hair very nicely, but if you haven't disinfected, uh, you know, their their hands, then they're still going to scratch their eyes and get the virus. Um, so this is not a panacea, but it's it may be a technology worth looking at. I, I thought we might get him on since he's a colleague and um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Have him talk about he's it. He's a well-trained uh, environmental physicist mm-hmm. who uh, I used to teach a course in which he was one of the presenters, and uh, he's very precise and very conservative, and I, I, I yeah. trust what he says. That sounds that sounds very promising. But again, the warning for UVC lamps are the ones that are commercially easily available. Don't play with those. That's this is a this is a totally different. And don't technology. go to the tanning salon just to get sterilized. <laughs> no, don't go to the tanning salon. Period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's got ideas about about putting these in like train stations and, and yeah, exactly. the light. But exactly. I'd like to hear high, what high he's thinking problem. about and how he's going to yeah, test all that. All right, Ben writes. I ran into a study this morning which followed a number of COVID nineteen patients over time with both RT PCR and serology, different longitudinal patterns of nucleic acid and serology test results based on disease severity. Okay, of course, the sample size is tiny. Nobody wants to jump to conclusions, but what would it mean if most asymptomatic COVID-19 carriers never seroconvert? Is there an adaptive immune response going on, even if it is never revealed through rising levels of antibodies, or could some people clear the virus strictly with an innate response? Could some people become permanent vectors? A virus? No, I don't believe that would be the case. And finally, is the if the information that's accumulating turns out to be reliable, that is, there are lots of them, they can shed virus, and now they may be hard to identify, except through a program of regularly repeated PCR tests, then at what point do we throw up our hands and embrace the notion that absent a vaccine curtailing the exposure of the population is impossible? 
Um, well, I don't think it's impossible. We just saw from Sweden, they're up to 30% in Stockholm. And so I think it's possible. I think you cannot conclude from this at all, as you say, that there's uh, no immune response in asymptomatic carriers. I mean, that is really contrary to what we understand about uh, infections, right, Brianne? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, the one thing that strikes me when looking at Ben's letter is he asks what it would mean if most asymptomatic carriers never seroconvert. Uh, and the one thing I do think about that is that is a you know, a big caveat to some of those ideas about immunity passports, um, which are a horrible, horrible idea, idea anyway. for so many reasons. But this is just another reason. Why Yet not another a good idea. Well, I think they already know the answer to that in some studies, though, because there are far more positive people than there were positive cases. And they detected those by serologic surveys. So I think that the answer sure. is that that um, that asymptomatic carriers or asymptomatic people seroconvert. So, I, I mean, I think it's a little nuanced because asymptomatic may be so mildly symptomatic that you don't even report it. Or you could be pre symptom So it's it's hard to lump them all together, I think. But yes, I agree with you, Dixon. There are way more infections than we picked up. Yes. Otherwise, it would rule right. out seroepidemiology as a mechanism for yes, determining exactly. the I mean, prevalence. One of, of the things I've noticed during this outbreak is that lots of possibilities get put forth that are not consistent with everything we know about viruses and immunology. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is all yeah. true. Like people are going to get reinfected within a week or two. I mean, come on. Yeah, why don't we, yeah, we, yeah, you know, yeah. no. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and those are some extraordinary claims coming out. Yeah, Brianne, uh, we are down to Stephen. Can you uh, take sure. that one? Uh, Stephen writes, hi, all the way from Scotland. I have a friend that says that COVID-19 has not been identified and asked me to send him the evidence of how they identified it. <laughs> I said he sounds like David Ick. Can you help, please? Send a link to the sequence. Yes. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> do they say that COVID-19 has not been identified or that SARS-CoV-2 has not been identified? Well, I think he means the virus probably. Right. So send him a link to I mean, nextstrain.org. It, it outlines the lineage of the virus. It, it has a lay summary. Next, nextstrain.org will answer all of his questions. It sounds like your friend doesn't read, Stephen. So David Ick is a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I of get to course. do the next one, right? No, Rich is next. Oh, what happened Rich, to me? We come next after Rich. <laughs> oh, okay. David writes, uh, dear Twiv team, I'm one of your new COVID-19 listeners. <laughs> we're, a COVID, we're now a COVID-19 podcast. Stick around. Yes. This is going to be over. We do other things. I am just a family practice doctor from Detroit, but I have never appreciated uh, a reliable source for coronavirus-related science, especially in podcast form, since that's my favorite way to keep up to date. Thanks for what you're doing. My question is about racial disparities in infection rates and outcomes. I work at a community health center in Detroit, so I'm well aware of the impact of socioeconomic factors and racism on health disparities, and I agree with your analysis that this is probably driving the disparities we are seeing in, seeing in COVID-19 outcomes. Still, I can't help wondering if there might be genetic variation in the expression of the ACE2 protein that could play a role. I don't know the science behind it, but in clinical practice and guidelines, doctors are well aware that ACE inhibitors don't work as well in African Americans. Might this be because of differences in the ACE protein or its expression levels? And if so, could such differences affect infection risk and outcomes? Are you aware of anyone looking at this? Keep up the good work, David. Well, I can't address that with science. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. There is a, a logical thread there for sure. And there are, uh, yeah. and, uh, we have identified at least on an individual basis with some, 
uh, infections in the past that individuals who have uh, variations in, you know, genetic differences of one sort or another, uh, commonly affecting uh, innate immunity, can have different susceptibilities to infections. But with respect to this particular uh, issue, I can't speak to it. Anybody it, else? It is. It is a possible. Yeah, I would say it's a possibility that um, is going to be really hard to tease out from the other yeah, factors, the confounding the variables. Factors, yep. the, the, yeah, the, the structural racism that we talked about before. I mean, those are those are such huge factors in health disparities, as David is well aware in Detroit, um, that I'm not sure you'll ever be able to detect the signal from something like this against that. But it's it's a reasonable idea. I mean, that people can have varying levels of, of protein expression that could affect um, risk and, and outcomes. And maybe eventually somebody will have the tools to look at that. Do you think it might be epistatic too? Because as the comorbidities comorbid- develop, you get epistatic expression and it may be epistasis. So you may not be able to even find it um, necessarily genetically unless you look for epistatic variations. Michael, yeah. for the uh, non-science listeners, could you please describe epistatic for us? It's where your body begins to change its genome in a non-uniform way that is not heritable. You're talking or, about epigenetic. That's yeah. epigenetic. Epigenetics. Epigenetics. Yeah. Epigenetic, oh, okay. yes. Okay. I figured that was yeah. what you meant. Well, I'm sorry. I, I did want you to clarify. Epistatic, it, epistatic is a mechanism yeah. upstream of a of a gene, but could be, could be silencing, right? Chromatin silencing. Yeah, of course. Sure. We don't know. I think it's good, and and you know there are genetic association studies underway, and we'll see what happens. It is important to remember, though, that um, the genetic differences between racial groups are much smaller than the genetic differences within most racial groups. Right. What what we see in skin in skin color has an immense effect on how we classify people socially, but actually turns out to be kind of a small story genetically. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So it, it you know the, these are the kinds of things that could be looked at genetically, but against the background of what's going on socially, it it, it just may be very difficult to dissect this out. The Hops, Hopkins website uh, has a section uh, listing which states are keeping track of um, racial and ethnicities with regards to uh, comorbidities and death rates and in case fatalities, etc. But that data isn't being listed. They're just telling you which states are doing this, but they don't actually give Not you the data. Not right? Not yet. Um, Dixon, you read that one? Yes. Oh. Trey writes, I have noticed that there is some variation in the treatment regimens. Hypothetically, if you had a patient with COVID-19 and not doing well, and you had 20 doctors offering their own recommendations, would you get 20 different courses of treatment? You should ask Dave, uh, Daniel Griffin that question because he's already answered it. How much of medicine is art and how much is science? What I'm trying to understand is what do doctors use as selection criteria to try something different? Besides publishing in medical journals, do doctors in high caseload areas have a way to communicate their experiences with treatment to other doctors across the country? And that's that's a perfect segue into what we are doing here uh, for TWIV because we have Dr. Daniel Griffin report to us uh, weekly and sometimes twice weekly as to what's going on in North Shore Hospital, which has a very large catchment of patients. And he's in contact also with other hospitals throughout the New York metropolitan area. And he's he's a big um, believer that if doctors all throw the kitchen sink at their patients and the patient gets better, uh, you'll never know why. So these are control studies that are necessary for each one of these treatments, and he's a big believer in science, of course, and he, he's not a believer that if the treatment starts to work that you should continue the study. You should obviously stop it and then start that treatment, but in the meantime, um, he's frustrated with all of these um, 
anecdotal story, as, uh, as it turns out, from a, a single physician that said, you know, I gave hydroxychloroquine to my patient and they got so much better. And another patient and, then, and another doctor said something else. And another. So the it's not an art. It's a try something and see what happens type of situation. Because right now, uh, this virus infection has no specific therapy. And as a result, everybody's right and everybody's wrong until the science is done. And, and that's what we're working on. And that's exactly what we're believing in is the facts. So until we start dealing with facts, uh, I don't really have any faith that 20 doctors offering their own recommendations. I think 20 doctors offering the same recommendation after the science is done, that's what I'm waiting for. I think you should listen to one of Daniel. I think two Fridays ago, Daniel went on about, yeah. you know, uh, science-based medicine versus everyone trying their exactly. own thing. And, but right. and it depends yeah. where you are in the country, right? You may not have a lot of contact and you're on your own sometimes for yep. this is true <laughs> this is true i mean that's why being in a big area is helpful because you have a lot of experience there but no question let's about do two more uh, alan you have uh, victors there okay um i heard and read many times your argument we could have had a pan had pan coronavirus antivirals if only we'd tried hard enough since the original sars outbreak i'm tro totally with you but there's one thing that really worries me at least with COVID 19 these antivirals will have to be presumably taken early in the course of infection when there's a chance to significantly reduce viral replication you discussed that last time with daniel griffin about remdesivir but that means they would have to be prescribed basically prophylactically so that would mean they would probably have to be widely prescribed or it would have little or no effect. But that in turn would mean selective pressure for coronaviruses to evolve some sort of resistance to these antivirals. <clears throat> and we, in essence, help emerge um, untreatable strains of these viruses. I admit I make it excessively dramatic. There are probably ways around this, combination drugs, etc. But I would love to hear your opinion on that. Uh, and a couple of little things. While reading the scientific literature, I notice more and more the term RNA load instead of viral load when describing PCR results. Is it the TWIV influence? And just a funny coincidence this morning, I was listening to the talk by Susan Weiss. You linked to you linked from the, uh, the TWIV episode with her while I was training on a bike trainer. It was rather hard to follow, but when it ended, the YouTube AI chose to play as the next video, nothing else but what is a virus lecture by Vincent fresh from the 2020 course. <laughs> Apparently it sensed my confusion and recommended I started with the basics. <laughs> nothing like AI, right? That's right. And Victor's at yeah, Moscow. That's great. Um, yeah. I mean, a, a potential problem with antivirals is that you'll get viral resistance. The logic of having anti-coronaviral antivirals on hand, um, if we had taken the original SARS outbreak as the warning shot that it apparently was, would be that um, these probably would be useful even after people turn up symptomatic. And if we had them sitting there and had done some level of testing on them already, we'd be a lot closer to getting to a point of coming with the with the science based management that Daniel talks about and saying, OK, we've got, you know, these three drugs already in the pharmacopoeia or in the stockpile. Um, you don't have to buy out all the hydroxychloroquine that the lupus patients need. You can use these drugs instead and have some positive effect. But, yes, if you go around prophylactically giving these drugs to everybody, that could lead to some problems. I think you should mention also the HIV AIDS story because. Uh, in the beginning, there were limited numbers of drugs, and they gave them, and the you know, organism became resistant right away. But with a triple therapy, it's very, very difficult. I think the ideal um, – look, the ideal drug, you're going to have multiple drugs, I agree. But you have a patient – it's hard because if you're already – it's very sick and you get admitted, it's probably too late for an antiviral at that point, as we mentioned. But so how do you find people? Prophylactic is always difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to give healthy people drugs. So I agree. This is a problem and I'm not sure how to deal with it. Well, one way of dealing with this as part of comprehensive pandemic preparedness, I mean, fix up our health system is item number one, but um, then when we talk about antivirals, we need to talk about uh, viral testing yes. and having platforms, general purpose platforms for it and ways of rolling those out in a hurry. Oh, I agree. Um, and, the, and this has been proven 
possible and feasible already because if you compare the way South Korea and the U.S. responded to this virus, and we had our first cases right about the same time, and the way it played out in South Korea is totally different from the way it played out in the U.S., and a huge part of that is that they were ready. Mm Mm-hmm. And they had testing ready to go and they ran around testing and contact tracing and just the whole bit. And they figured out where it was and they stopped it or at least really, really slowed it down. Um, And so so testing is a critical component there. And if you had a combination of therapies and testing and adequate amounts of testing, you could say, hey, you've got the virus. Yes, exactly. And all your contacts could be treated as well. Yeah. And all your contacts could yeah. be, and then you're not prophylactically treating right. the whole population. You're only treating the people who've had contacts. So the thing that happened in Korea recently, of course, is that they opened up the professional baseball league again, but nobody's yes. allowed to go to watch the games. Right. So they play an empty stadium. But so they have little pictures of people sitting in the seats. So the players think <laughs> it looks a little bit like an audience. <laughs> right. Since, but Dixon, if, if no one's there, does the ball make a sound when it <laughs> right when they hit it with the bat? Does the but does the bat make a noise when it falls out of your hand? That's right. That That's who is still on first. All right, though. last one, Michael. Can you take Brigitte? Uh, Brigitte writes, "Dear Twiv, in Switzerland, our governor, so our government, similar to some others, has proposed a three phase easing of restriction. Each phase seems to be contingent on how the previous phase goes." in terms of keeping new daily cases of infections from going up. My question is, how will we be able to interpret the number of positive positive cases per day if testing capabilities are expanded at the same time? If there is indeed a large number of asymptomatic people, the number of new cases will increase with more testing. If this is the case with Will the only option to monitor the phasing be dependent upon hospital admission rather than population-wide testing results? Considering the lag time between infection and onset of symptoms and hospitalization, using rate of hospitalization seems largely inadequate in helping us to avoid a second wave. What are your thoughts? Assuming we never achieve population wide, reliable antibody testing for COVID to really understand what has been going on past and present. Well, I would argue that this should be a global priority that is population-wide, reliable antibody testing for COVID. I think I think that's the only way we're going to have a true understanding of all the funny business that's been going on as to whether or not you can get reinfected, whether or not people never become immune, and all of these other foibles that seem to be going on with the pandemic. We're still very early in the stages of the pandemic, and each of the questions you raise are indeed important questions that nation states need to be wrestling with in a big way because you're changing too many variables trying to make a conclusion based on all the variables you are changing. We teach our students only to change one variable at a time. <laughs> and, and and yet we're changing all of them at the same time. So I don't know. What do, what do uh, my colleagues think about uh, the questions that she, I mean, she asked all the really tough questions. And I think the only way we're really going to get at it is population wide reliable antibody testing? I agree. I think I think she's yeah. asked all the right questions, uh, and I think uh, uh, better testing is ultimately the answer. But in the meantime, I would hope that you have epidemiologists and statisticians with these questions in mind, analyzing the data that are available to come up with the best sort of solution to the current problem. Well, I think if. It- yeah, and you can test. You can look at statistics such as the the percent of tests that come back positive when you're doing the RNA testing, um, and that'll that'll tell you if you're testing enough. If half your tests come back positive, you're not testing mm-hmm. enough. 
Or you're um, testing, testing. Uh, I mean, the less half your population is actively infected. Yeah, you're testing the wrong population. So this is something Massachusetts is doing now. They're tracking, um, and it's finally coming down. They're back down to only 10% of the tests coming back positive. It was up, you know, 20, 30% for a little while. Um, so they're looking at that to indicate whether they're doing enough testing. And then they're also looking at positive case numbers. And you can, if statisticians can kind of combine those and say, okay, is is this waxing or waning? Um, and you can paint a picture that way. But these are still really important questions. And the antibody testing is going to be good. Antibody testing is going to be a key component in figuring out who's already been infected. Uh, Bridget seems to um, simplify that by saying it's a three-stage process of letting uh, business as usual resume. But the CDC just recently issued uh, an 80 page recommendation, which issue. was how many pages? They tried to issue. <laughs> they it. tried to, no, they, they still did. You can actually get it someplace, but. Can you? Yeah. But you it, can get it from the Associated Press because somebody leaked yeah, exactly, it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. Right. But the CDC did not actually, no, it, they were not allowed to release it. It was prevented document. from being distributed yes. because. If you follow all their regulations, they would not open again until the curve is almost flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the idea. the the idea The idea of a phased reopening is sound, though. And if Switzerland is going to do it, depending on how they've defined the phases, uh, if they've if they've defined three phases, that's fine. I've seen five phase plans, um, and and that is a sound approach to take. Um, as long as you set the parameters on those that's, that's right. So it would have been interesting to see the meatpacking industry, for instance, in Nebraska or in uh, North Dakota, uh, only admit back to work the people who tested positive for the antibody to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. Because there are lots of people out there in those areas that are already exposed and, and now beyond uh, uh, symptomatic because they can go back but to work. Need a control and they should well, have only hired those people rather than putting everybody at risk again. And, and they've just... The problem, yeah, but Dixon, the problem is even if you try to do that experiment, that's the immunity passport okay. idea. Even if you try to do that on a tiny scale at one meatpacking plant, you have created instantly an immense incentive for everybody who used to work there to go out and get infected yeah well some of them did otherwise some of them died have, otherwise they can't get their job no back. some of them did and some well they all went back yeah to yeah i see your point but what happens if you go and you test negative so you're still unemployed yeah but what's worse that or having everybody go back to work and everybody gets sick I think a lot of people are going to get then go out and try and expose themselves to the virus. In, and in fact, even, even proposing the idea is dangerous because that. people I are going to try and go that. out and get infected. The to get chicken pox party. I've, I've seen that. So this is, yeah, yeah exactly, the chicken pox exactly. party. And this is going to cause a, a spike, an additional spike in infections. I can guarantee that. Well, <laughs> um, it's one of the many reasons that the immunity passport idea yeah. is so bad. There must be a hundred reasons why the curve is going to go back up again when they open this thing up. Yeah. But I, I think I, I think giving that as a as a prerequisite for work is just going to set you up for a much bigger problem. So one thing puzzled me about the North Dakota meatpacking outbreak. Do we know whether or not swine can actually harbor the virus? Because I, don't I, don't, I, I was trying to understand how 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 that entire meatpacking plant in North Dakota, which is pretty much socially isolated, there's only 500,000 people in North Dakota, and they didn't have a large pre predominance of a virus at that point in time before that blew up in the meatpacking plant. No, uh, the incubation period is long. Have you studied the meatpacking industry at all? <laughs> the meatpackers yeah, migrant packed. workers. Migrant. It's these these facilities are uh, if somebody showed up with SARS-CoV-2 at one of these facilities, I would be shocked if everybody didn't. That's get right. It. I agree. Very close. It's cheek to jail. These places, the, these places are packed with folks who have little to no access to health care and they work side by side up to their up to their waist in guts. And just I mean, the environment is conducive to spreading whatever you got. Yeah, I, I'm not at all. I'm not at all surprised by that. Outcome. I was trying to think of a word other than saying that they were packed. Yes, uh. they, they, 
there's <laughs> there's there's packed in there like spam in a can. There All right. Well, that's a good way to end this. <laughs> spam in a can with a six one one show notes microbe tv slash twiv questions and comments twiv at microbe tv. If you like what we do, you can support us microbe.tv slash contribute today on twiv our guest has been from uh, the medical university of south carolina michael schmidt thanks michael nice to have you thanks thanks michael thanks, thanks. appreciate it oh yeah, good it's loads of fun i i have now completed my second uh visit to or my first visit to twiv i have to get to all the other twivos or twixes <laughs> right. Yeah, we like crossovers. So you got a bucket list, eh? <laughs> yes, my bucket list. Dixon de Pommiers, trickinella.org, the living river.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Free embarkers at Drew University over on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Safe drives. Thank you. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is on Twitter as Alan Dove, and he's got a blog called turbidplaque.com where you can read about why he thinks immunity passports are not a good idea. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Societies for Virology and Microbiology. Those are two separate societies for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>